Um, okay. So I think this is working now. I think so. Oh yeah, yeah, it is. Okay. Um, uh, hello everyone. I am Lucia and I will be delivering a workshop on how to not suck at principles. I think principle arguments are great and I wish that everyone was better at them. Um, so here's my attempt to make everyone slightly better at them. So this workshop comes with an accompanying PowerPoint in case that, like me, you get easily distracted by a video and end up doing something else on Facebook. Or if you just in general are way too lazy to kind of like look at the live stream and instead you want to do something else. So um, the link is down in the description if you want to look at it. And it's fair to like just look at it or also to come to like come to it after the thing is done and just look at that. Okay, so um, principles, those elusive, mysterious creatures. I think that people are generally okay at identifying principles in debates. I think that the thing that people are generally not great at is uh, developing those principles to make a cohesive argument. So I am not going to be giving you a workshop on how to identify principles in debates. I think that all of you can probably distill that. I'm going to mostly be talking about three things. One is how to take that principle that you already have and develop it into a fully fledged argument. And the second thing is how to respond to principles and which I also think that people are not great at and how to weigh them in debates. The last thing I'm going to be talking about is some broad stuff on how they are useful in debates, because I do think that although we claim all the time that you can win based on principles, it's probably not true. And also some little notes on rhetoric and how you can exploit that with principles. So uh, to talk about non-consequentialism in debates first, I think that everyone is kind of bad at it. And I don't think it's anyone's fault. It's just that matter of factly, we do value less uh, principles in general. So, um, so like, I think that the principle that is most commonly used in debate lines, kind of like, or principle is that we want to do what is best for everyone. And that's not really a principle because just because something like, say, if you're standing for education, it's something that you like and that yields you good outcomes, it doesn't mean that it's bright or moral on principle. Oftentimes, principles go against, like, directly against consequentialism, which is, I think, what makes them very difficult to weigh in debates. So where the principles come from, I think, is a next very obvious question. And what are they in debates? And I think that the problem with principles and the reason why they're so difficult to utilize in debates is that they often come from sort of society's morals. And society's morals are often really arbitrary and weird. Like, I don't know, if I told you that yesterday I had really great sex with a really amazing person, and then you'd probably be like, okay, that's fine, that's too much information, but that's fine. If I told you that that really amazing person was actually my brother, that'd be a bit of a like, uh. And afterwards, you could probably justify it with something such as, oh yeah, the reason why I'm cringing at this is because it may, yield, it may mean that your children have genetic abnormalities in the future, or it may also mean that it's like a relationship that's not fully consensual or something like that. But the original cringe reaction is not really because of that. The original cringe reaction is simply a, I don't like this for some reason, and I don't know how why. In the same way that we frown upon people eating other people's meat as in like consensual cannibalism even if the other person previously agreed to it before dying right we also think that that's wrong for some weird inexplicable reason that we can't really put into words and i think that that's the problem with it right that principled arguments are oftentimes based on those arbitrary weird morals that society values and the problem with that is that then they're quite difficult to put into arguments um so then, how do we make a principled argument out of this? I think that the first thing that you absolutely ought to do is to find your principle. What I mean by this is just identify what is it that the, 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 the debate is asking you to debate about. So I think that most of these are pretty self-explanatory and really easy to identify. So like, what do I mean by this? For example, um, this house would create a black successionist state in the United States it's obviously asking you to talk about reparations. When you're talking about using human shields in asymmetrical warfare, it's asking you to talk about just war. When you're talking about like making CEOs liable for things that their company does, like environmental abuse, you're talking about responsibility and whether we should give them that responsibility in courts. When you're talking about allowing people to undergo human, so like uh, cosmetic plastic surgery, 
or allowing people to sell, sell their organs, then you're talking about choice or oftentimes more specifically bodily autonomy. And then you're talking about like the secreting, like the South believes that the secretion of religious sites is a legitimate tactic of warfare. You're also talking about just war, but you're importantly also talking about human dignity. I think that most people are relatively okay at identifying what principle is at stake in the debate. So then the question is really, how do you go from that point to taking it to a fully developed argument rather than just telling the judge, oh, we stand here in favor of human dignity or whatever. So I did write down like a couple of principles that I think are quite common in debates. A bunch of those are things like one reparations. I think that they're quite common and pop up a lot in minority debates. Uh, when you're talking about um, giving something back to a minority, be it in direct reparations, like this house would give reparations to women, or just sort of like, uh, you owe this to them because you have oppressed them for generations and that can be deployed in basically any minority to it. Um, I think that the responsibility is often a big one when you're talking, especially in uh, justice or legal debates, when you're talking about like, this house would allow individuals to sue Facebook executives for the misuse of data by Cambridge Analytica, you're talking about whether or not they're responsible and therefore they should be awarded some form of court penalty or they should be held liable for this. I think that oftentimes responsibility often comes in other sort of uh, identity politics or minority debates when you're talking about how like whether it is the responsibility of an oppressed group of our society to do x or y for example i think quite a good example is this house believes that minority parents should encourage their children to aspire to moral minority images instead of combating stereotypes because on one hand prop can say oh it's not good for the children. You should not put this responsibility to find a monster that is racism upon them. And on the other hand, you have to prove that it is in some form the responsibility or it is a burden that you should put onto these children. I think other things that often come up is just war. They come up in basically every, this house would allow states to do X or Y in war. Other things that come up often is I think bodily autonomy, democracy, and I think also importantly, liberty versus security. So like debates about privacy and whether it's worth doing this for the sake of national security pop up really often. And lastly, and I think this one is quite important and it's probably worth taking a note in, is the pillars of justice. I think that a lot of justice debates, and we're going to talk about one in a little bit, um, do talk about how uh, we should value one thing over others in the justice system or how when we should implement a specific thing in the justice system, I think that it's important that you can make principled arguments based on whether or not it's coherent with justice. So like the principles of justice that I could say exist are kind of like retribution, deterrence, rehabilitation and reparations or victims justice. So for example, if you're saying like, um, this house will allow prisoners to volunteer for drug trials in exchange for lighter sentences, apart from the very obvious practical arguments that you can make out of like having more people go into drug trials and how that might influence medicine and discovery and how it might make drug production cheaper, you can also definitely talk about how this is um, this is coherent with the aims of the justice system in regards to, for example, rehabilitation or also retribution and get, um, sorry reparations and giving back to society in some form. Um, so, like these are just kind of like common principles that I think appear in most principal debates. So that then the real question is like, how do you go from that and make it into an argument? And I think that the easiest way to exemplify a principle is by something that I call, and a lot of people call, intuition pumps or analogies. Um, the reason for that is because, as I already mentioned, principles are oftentimes very hard to accurately measure. This means that when you, like, like what I mean by an intuition pump is sort of like, when else do we enshrine this particular right in society? I think that this is both one, good at illustrating things and appealing to the judges intuitions of like obviously we always do this um but second it's also oftentimes a lot easier to explain why that very obvious thing that we have in society that we always abide by is there than the thing that you're trying to explain um so like i don't know if it's very clear what i mean by intuition pumps but i basically mean why where else do we allow this to exist in society um so for example, when you're talking about like, um, yeah, so I'm gonna give an example in a little bit. So I think that then like there's four things that you have to talk about. So like, for example, in the responsibility thing, right? This house would make 
like let's take an example motion of this house believes that football clubs should be held responsible for the actions of their fans the principle that you ought to be defending is responsibility and therefore whether or not they should be held legally accountable so then you look for intuition poems or analogies as in where else do we hold people responsible for actions that aren't theirs and then you can give that analogy or that intuition bump and then exemplify how is it that it's the same so then there are four things that i think are very important to have in every principled argument first is the right that you are defending the second is your analogy or your intuition pump and when do we enshrine it or, or like when do we enshrine this right in society then third explain how this right this this intuition pump is basically the same thing as the thing that you are defending and lastly, why this matters. So for example, again, this house believes that football clubs should be held responsible for the actions of their fans. You're enshrining the principle of responsibility, that it is their responsibility, so it's fair to hold them legally responsible and legally liable. Then you introduce your intuition pumps. When do we hold people responsible for actions that aren't theirs? When they caused harm, uh, when they were the cause of harm. So when my actions led to someone else being hurt, and in this case, um, football clubs oftentimes sell very cheap alcohol in their stadiums. That means that people become more rowdy and become hurt, which means that we can hold them responsible. We also hold people responsible when they have failed in their job. So when they had a job to do and they were negligent at it, we also hold them responsible over that. And given that clubs have a responsibility to make people feel safe and keep people in the premises safe, if their fans cause destruction or harm other people, then they should be held liable because they have failed in their job of keeping people within their premises safe. And lastly, when you directly benefit from the actions that cause harm, right? So oftentimes clubs encourage things such as rivalries because that means that they get more loyal followings and more people support them and they get more rowdy fans and much more passionate followings. So like the Glasgow Rangers directly benefit from the rivalry with the Celtics, which means that given that they benefit from this they should probably be held accountable in some way because they're gaining a profit so you're explaining the analogy and you're saying why it's the same and why it applies and lastly the fourth thing i think you'd have to explain obviously why this is a principle that matters in society and why it's important and i think that the reason why is because justice should happen regardless of outcomes we put people in jail not just because it's supposed to stop crime but also because it is fair and that is how we deem like the intensive like punishment that fits the crime right so if someone is responsible for something then they should go to jail for it and be held responsible for that so those are the, like four things that i think you need to have the right you're defending an analogy or an intuition pump or when do we enshrine and lastly an explanation of how it's the same or why it happened how, how it's the same thing and lastly why this is a principle that's important or that matters to people um all right so then after this and here's the thing that I'm, I'm not entirely sure if it's going to work out so we'll see how it goes but if it doesn't feel free to stop me or say something you people that are watching right now and if not it's there's like a bunch of links underneath um so i think that the easiest way to sort of see this is either by a me giving you a speech and a principled argument um within that but i think that's a little bit weird so what I'm instead going to do is try and show you some videos of really, really good speakers who give principled arguments and try and deconstruct them. I think that the, the most important thing to note here is that I'm not asking you to copy their arguments. I think that watching debates of really good speakers is basically useless. I think that what I'm asking you is to sort of bring, like boil it down to their bones and see how behind all the rhetoric and fancy speech that they use because they're very good speakers, they're at its core using the same structure that I just told you about um so let's see if it works and yeah okay so i think it should be kind of working now yeah um so then let's watch a little bit of uh world's finals winning speech i'm not entirely sure the audio will work we'll see two things then i'm going to begin this speech with first Private property constitutes a fundamental assault in human dignity in three key respects. First, it is found and it has been acquired unjustly. 
in the vast majority of instances, the reason why wealthy countries are wealthy is through processes like colonialism, through slavery, through patriarchy. It represents plunder when you refuse to give any representation or resources to whom, from whom you took money. But even if it wasn't in those direct instances of theft, in many instances it was negligence. That's to say the creation of vastly constrictive intellectual property rates. That means that individuals don't in the poor have proper access to things like medication. It's refusal to tax properly. We think negligence is just as morally culpable. The fact that it is unjustly acquired in and of itself gives the poor a claim to that property and to the, uh, and to an institution that has itself been harmful. The second thing it enables the poor in terms of a principle is that it allows them to get redress in, in opposition to centuries of disenfranchisement. That is to say, theft and negligence represent the stripping of the individual right to assert themselves. We're going to give you systematic reasons. Yeah, so I think that that is probably enough. Um, I think that here, so here's the important thing that I wanted to note, right? It has beautiful rhetoric, right? It sounds amazing, but if you boil it down to its bones, you can see that it's skeleton. It's basically the same principle structure that I just gave you. So the argument that he's making is, yes, it is justified because the rich, because if the rich capital is acquired unjustly, therefore the poor should take it back. So that's his principle. He says that we do the same thing for theft and for negligence. Here is his analogy. And he explains how it is the same. It is theft because it was acquired through colonialism and slavery. And it is negligence because we create the laws that inadvertently deny the poor the ability to climb the social ladder, even when that's something that they should be entitled to. Then he makes the principle explicit and he explains why we care about it, right? He says that this principle argument is not reliant on practice. It is important because compensation to the poor is insufficient. In principle, they need the wealth back. So underneath all the fancy rhetoric, it's basically that for those four things that he's doing, right? He's telling you the principle, he's using analogies and intuition pumps and telling you why it's the same. And he's lastly explaining why this principle matters and why this is something that we should care about in society. Um, okay, so then once we see this, I don't, um, yeah, so I hope that this is like sort of useful at exemplifying how this kind of works. Um, I have another one that I'd like to share with you, which is, I think, slightly more recent. Um, so let's try and go for that one. Uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, by the way, um, the motion on this one is, this house believes that the United States should issue guest worker visas under which minimum wage laws do not apply. about backlash, but otherwise it's illegitimate for the government to do so. Secondly, why there is a law about backlash, but otherwise it's illegitimate for the government to do so. Secondly, why there is a long-term market failure, and this is something which is going to just say have significant economic impacts in the local revolution, and why essentially the market is going to fail to the long-term action string, and thirdly, why it actually harms the basic rights of immigrants, and also people who are minorities within the US right now, the battle is in the middle. First point, look. Essentially, this is a unique election that the U.S. is undergoing right now. Unlike many other elections, which are many, many different topics and many things that people decide upon, it's really hard to get the intensity of preferences of what people actually desire. This is incorrect for the last election cycle in the U.S. There was actually the predominant question whether the U.S. should be open or closed. This is exactly the contradiction between Clinton and Trump. Essentially, the key policy which the vast majority of Trump supporters under the Electoral College, which is a part of the United States, have supported the Trump regime is the idea of the closer economy. Don't. And here's something crucial that you need to underline. It is not a utilitarian metric at the heart of this debate. If this was the case, what we should do is take 100% taxation and send the money in foreign aid to Africa in order to make sure that less people are starving. This is not something that the US should do, presumably, under the criteria that is set by the government. 
Essentially, in a democracy, the public are the sovereign and they have the capacity to decide what are the metrics and what is actually the truth because there is no absolute truth within a modern democratic system. Right? There is no such thing as socialism, socialism being inherently greater than capitalism. Essentially, if the United States actually chooses to prioritize their own values and metrics above the capacity to have greater GDP, which is not clearly to be intrinsically greater, this is something just plainly legitimate and the utilitarian metric is not the correct one to win it. They say, ah, but you have an obligation to other people around the world. Uh, yeah, so again, I think that that's probably just quite enough to sort of showcase the principal argument. So, like, again, the motion, this house believes that the US should issue guest worker visas on the which minimum wage laws do not apply. Now, he does it in a slightly not as, like, struck, like, in a, in a slightly different order than the one that I told you about, but it's basically the same thing, right? He's first arguing for the principle he's defending that it violates democracy and therefore it's illegitimate. Then he explains that the main divide in the United States election was whether the American economy should be open, Clinton, or close Trump, and that closed one. Then he gives an analogy. And he says that democracy is oftentimes not valued in utilitarian metrics because if it were, then the United States government should take 100% taxation and send it all to feed starving people. But it doesn't because we don't manage democracies by utilitarian metrics. And he explains why that is. Because in a democracy, the public and sovereign and can decide what to do because there is no absolute truth, which means that if you choose to prioritize your own values over like the, the American values or whatever that means, or your capacity to have greater GDP, then it is legitimate, then it is illegitimate to force you to otherwise, because that's a choice that you are the population that gets to decide, is entitled to, given that, again, we don't value democracies on a utilitarian metric. And fourthly, note how he still, throughout the whole of the argument, he, is ex he's, he makes the fact that this is a non-utilitarian metric explicit. I think that, like, you can see how, even if it's in a slightly different order than the one that I gave you, it still has those four components of giving the principle, having an analogy, explaining why it's the same, or why both of those things exist in society. And lastly, about why we value that and why that is important. Um, so I think that like that's the important thing that I wanted to sort of explain and exemplify is that all principle arguments ought to have those four things. And I think that that is the easiest way to sort of take your principle argument to the next level, right? To make sure that they always have those four components. And I think that sort of like practicing at how to make them, et cetera, et cetera, does get a lot easier once you realize that that is the core structure that most principle arguments have. Um, all right. So then when I was asking around at what other things people had trouble with, uh, I, I think that came up is that if they found it very difficult to sort of argue against principles or just weigh them in debates. So I also have now I want to like quickly talk about, well, not very quickly necessarily, um, but I do want to talk about how you argue against a principle. And I think that there are two ways to do that. The first one is, like, and, 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 and this is true of every single rebuttal, right? Of Ideally, you want to do both and follow the two-pronged argument, the two-pronged structure that most rebuttals have. And the first one is that you want to argue directly with the logic of the principle, how even if this is a principle, like it's very difficult to be like, no, I don't respect bodily autonomy and also fuck democracy and I hate human dignity. Like it's very difficult to argue against the principle being a thing or being important. But the thing that you can argue about is whether or not this principle applies in this particular scenario. And I think that's the thing that you ought to do. Uh, how, yes, this is a principle, but in this circumstance, it doesn't apply. And the second thing is to do some weighing, right? Which is known as an even if, right? Even if you buy this principle, or this argument, here is why our principle or our arguments are more important than that, and we should value that over this. Ideally, again, you should want to vote. So how do you argue directly with the logic of the principle? And I think that the most useful way to do that is to start thinking about, OK, it's true that, I don't know, like bodily autonomy or choice is a principle. And it's a right that people have. So when do we limit those? Because it's very, like, it's, it's not impossible to find it, it's basically impossible to find a principle or a right that we can think of like a few circumstances where we don't enshrine that right or where we say that it's morally justified to violate it, right? Um, we sometimes do it when it's useful, when it's beneficial to protecting the state, so like violating privacy for the sake of protecting everyone, or it's very rare that it's never. The most common thing, I think, is that we violate them under very specific circumstances, right? 
Um, where you, you have freedom to act on things until it causes harm in some form. Um, you have bodily autonomy on, 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 unless it violates in some way consent. Um, but I think the most useful thing is to think about when in particular we don't enshrine that principle. And then you sort of do the same thing that we did for principle arguments, right? You go like, okay, fine, this is a principle, but, okay, fine, like, this is a principle, but it doesn't apply here because we only do this principle for these situations or we only limit it for these situations, and here it doesn't apply, right? It is not the same. So instead of explaining why it's the same as an intuition pump, you explain why it's different than an intuition pump, and lastly, um, why this is important, right? Um, so again, like last example, this is like the last video that I'm going to show you or share, um, which is in an old, slightly controversial untold motion, but I think that the principle still applies to like a lot of debates, including this house would ban cosmetic plastic surgery, right? The motion was this house would ban all procedures to alter one's racial appearance, but I think that the principle still works if you're doing like this house would ban uh, cosmetic plastic surgery or something along those lines. Um, so like, let's see, where did it go? There we go. Okay. Uh, so let's hear it. But you know, it can be shown to be harmful to large groups, right? The, the standard utilitarian thing, right? We think that there is a bar according to which you cannot use my personal choice simply to social engineer the greater good. And that bar is the way is when my personal choices affect other people, not by making other options concretely cut off for them, but by influencing their opinions. So, for instance, it's not okay for me to slam the door in a you know theater on fire when other people are trying to escape because they Sir. escape whether or not they like it. No, thank you. But in a situation where my actions influence them, not by reducing the choices they have, right? That's how most reduce the choices available, but by changing their minds about what they like to look like. We think that's fine. We think it's a proper respect for the autonomy of each person to have their own view of beauty and their own view of good life. No, thank you. That it can influence them that way. We don't think that's bad. Then we were told that. Um. Yeah. 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 So I think this is another example because he's like directly responding, right? Basically, he's directly responding to the argument of how altering your appearance also influences other people and it further entrenches social stereotypes and beauty and what is and is not acceptable and that your liberty to do whatever the fuck you want in society is limited at the point in which you cause harm onto another person, right? So it's a somewhat utilitarian principle, but it's definitely a principle. So he argues that it's not justified because one, he argues directly with the principle. He says, yes, we sometimes limit people's choices for the sake of community benefit, but we only do it under certain circumstances, and this is not it. So he's targeting the principle and explaining why this principle, and he's saying it doesn't apply in the circumstance. Then he says, um, like an analogy, right? He, and, and explains why it's not the same. He says, we only limit it when your personal choice limits other people's choices. And here is when he inserts the analogy, it's not okay to yell fire in a crowded theater because then I directly stop people from escaping. It is not the same, and here's how he explains it's not the same, that because me changing my appearance may influence people, but it doesn't limit anyone's choice. People still have a choice to whatever they want. I am not banning them or forcing them to do something. I am just vaguely influencing their choice. And we don't limit people's ability to make choices for themselves when in under those situations. And lastly, he explains why it's important because we're respecting people's choice. And in this situation, we're not justified in limiting it. Um, so I think this is probably the most useful way to engage with principles is to sort of like rebut them directly and be like, okay, even if we like, you don't have to say, oh no, fuck bodily autonomy, right? Or fuck choice, or yeah, we don't think that we should ever limit anyone's choice for community benefit. I should be allowed to like go outside and shoot people if I want to because it's my choice. You don't have to go to those extremes. You can just be like, we agree that this is a principle, but this principle doesn't apply here. We only enshrine this principle or we only limit this principle under very specific circumstances, and this isn't it. So I think this is a useful way to engage with it. The second thing that I think is useful to do, and here's the like two pronged argumentation thing, right? Is to weigh, them, to weigh them directly, to like do the weighing thing as we always do in BP and be very comparative. I think that the most useful way to think about it is to think about rights in conflict. I think it's very rare where in a debate where one side will just be right and have morality on their side. I think that most commonly 
both sides have somewhat of a moral of a moral claim that they can make right so in that point it comes up to which right do you think or which principle do you think is more important and which one do you value more essentially rights in conflict um often you end up having to analyze it on why x right is more important than y um i think that it most commonly co pops up in things such as oh why we value the right to life overall so like in security versus liberty debates when you say like why should we limit um people's privacy for the sake of security is because we think that the right to life is the most important right given that it allows you to access literally any other right because you can't do anything if you're dead so you can't have privacy if you're dead so we would rather enshrine this right and here is why you should value protecting um pr pr protecting national security over Lim over somewhat limiting people's privacy. I think that the other thing is preferencing utility, which is not necessarily life, right? Because equally from the other side, you could be like, the only reason that life is worth living is because we have certain individual liberties that we're able to enjoy within our lives. One of them is privacy. And then you explain why privacy is very important to some people. And at the point where you limit them, it makes no sense to enshrine right over it. We still have to find ways to, even if it's more difficult, respect those liberties that make life worth living in or quest to protect life. And then lastly, is just kind of like this makes this to make more sense when you're talking directly about like rights, right? So like right to life versus other rights. But you can also do it like one principle over the other. And I think that, so like recently I had a debate about um, legalizing the sale of human organs, which I think is a, like quite a straightforward case for both sides, right? Um, so in that debate, proposition obviously argues bodily autonomy and the ability of individuals to maximize their own choice. And if I want to sell my liver, then I should be allowed to sell my own liver because I know what's best for myself and the liver is part of my body. And as an extension of myself, I should be allowed to sell it. Opposition can argue then that on a principled level, uh, people probably have an inability to consent because we can't uh, conceptualize long-term harm, which means that I shouldn't be allowed to make that choice because I don't know if in 20 years I will be, like future me will be okay with having given that liver. And also that organs are in some way, shape or form unique, right? That you wouldn't allow me to, you, you wouldn't, like the state shouldn't allow me to sell myself into like indentured slavery or something like that and that given that organs are an extension of my body i should also not be allowed to whatever i want in regards to my organs that in some way like organs are magic and special and that we shouldn't be allowed to sell them just because so then i think that the weighing that you on proposition one to do is that you need to weigh what principles right to be like why do we still value choice over these principles of sort of like protecting consent and also the idea of like um, that you can't necessarily make always your own best choices for yourself. I think that one thing is to that you can obviously argue about whether or not uh, people can give consent to that. But I think that on a principle level, you can also do some weighing as to why the principle of choice should still come above that. You can be like, look, there are always going to be people on both sides who can and can't consent and people who agree that organs are in some way special and that they shouldn't be sold. And also people who think that it's the same as selling my hair, right? Who think that organs are not necessarily important. The key is that to be allowed to make those decisions for you. So you should be allowed to make that choice yourself in the same way that in society, there are people who are pro-choice and people who are pro-life, but the state shouldn't be like, I am banning abortions and I'm not allowing anyone to make this choice because I think that's what's best for everyone. Rather, the state should individually allow people who are pro-life to not get abortions and people who are pro-choice to get them if they so wish to. So that's why we ought to value choice overall, because when you do that, you respect everyone's opinion. And also because then when you allow that, when you have those, you can probably like try and maximize people's consent and take other measures to make sure that that is taken care of. But the most important thing is that the state cannot impose views upon you and that you should still be able to make your own choice. So in some way, you are still doing the weighing as to how is it that your principle of choice is more important than the ability of people to like consent or that the alternative opinion of people that think that organs should not be for sale, right? You say like, look, it's fine. Some people have that opinion. Maybe it's correct, maybe it's not. The point is that the state shouldn't be allowed to make that decision for you. And that's why we always lean on the side of choice, right? Um, so I think that the second thing that then you can do to 
argue with principal arguments. The first one is to rebut them directly and argue why the principle doesn't apply in this scenario. And the second one is a sort of more specific weighing of like rights in conflict. Here is why when you have both of these rights, you should always choose the one that we are arguing for. I think that the second one is probably the most difficult to conceptualize, um, but it does come up in like quite a few debates. Um, so I'm assuming no one has questions. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, all right. So um, I then kind of like want to do one that I think is not that obvious, but I want to kind of like talk through a motion that I think, yeah, that again, I think that the principle is not necessarily that obvious. And that also I think is quite a good example for a lot of debate that pop up quite often, particularly in regards to um, criminal justice and justice systems. Because as I talked about before, like, there are several different pillars to justice system and to the kind of like the um, philosophies that we use in regards to sentencing. So I think that it's oftentimes useful to in debates in, in debates to sort of deploy them. Um, so the motion I wanted to kind of like talk about a little bit is this house would allow judges to significantly exceed normal sentencing guidelines in areas of high crime. It got set at the LSE Open this year, and it was slightly controversial because a lot of people felt that the practicalities of that meant that you were putting like basically like high crime areas was another way to say um, heavily minority areas, which meant that you were imposing like a lot of punishment on people who are just victims of their own circumstance. I think that you can also make quite a strong principle argument that had that has nothing to do with that, but rather that talks about sort of like the pillars of justice, which is why like quite like this motion. Um, so I think that then like, let's go through kind of like the four things that I think principles should have. So one is kind of like the right that you are defending. So I think that on this motion, you do need to somewhat prove that it is coherent with the principle of justice. I think that specifically you can talk about, so like out of those pillars of justice that I mentioned, as I said, it's quite useful to sort of like keep them in your mind in justice motions. I think that you can talk about how specifically you can talk about how the principle of retribution is something that we value a lot in sentencing aka the that each crime should have a punishment that fits it um that the punishment should be proportional to the crime committed then you add an analogy or an intuition pump which is that a crime that you commit against a minority because they are a minority is classed as a hate crime and is punished harsher than if you commit the same crime without that incentive right if you like commit the same crime against like a straight white person just because and partly it's for two reasons, right? Because partly it's because it hurts that minority more by virtue of them being more vulnerable in society. But second is because it doesn't just affect that one individual that you committed the crime against, but rather it's a crime against the whole of the identity group rather than just one individual person. So then you are sort of like inserting your intuition pump or when in some situations, even if the crime is the same, we still punish it harsher. Then you explain why it's the same, right? Um, so when you commit a crime in a high crime community, it still hurts people more because they're more, they're poorer. They're also more vulnerable to everyday crime. And if it's like the third time that something awful happens to you in a week, it's probably worse than if it's like once a year, right? And then, so like, it does hurt people in those situations more. And second, I think that you can also argue that it doesn't just hurt the individual that who, on, on whom that crime was committed, right? That if you rob someone in a high crime area, it doesn't just affect them as traumatic as it is. It doesn't just affect them, but rather it affects the whole community through like a broken windows um, harm propagation, right? As in like, it helps make crime overall more acceptable. Um, it makes everyone around them incredibly more fearful. Uh, it makes crime like more acceptable. So like, it's not just a crime against you, but rather it's a crime that gets propagated across the whole community in a way that crime um, in a non in, in an area in like in a very rich area that doesn't have a lot of crime would not. So again, you're explaining like why it's very similar to that intuition bump. And then I think that you can make why this argument is important, which is because like the justice system doesn't just seek to maximize outcomes because otherwise we just lock everyone up in jail forever. We also seek to do things in a way that is fair, which is why we have trials, why we have punishments that fit the crime. And in this case, given that the crime is worse, then by the principle of retribution, it should also be punished harsher. So like overall, what does this argument look like? Um, this house would allow judges to significantly exceed normal sentencing guidelines in areas of high crime. 
we think that it's coherent with the principle of justice, specifically the principle of retribution, or the idea that you ought to have a punishment that fits the crime. Because, for example, uh, we often thought we already, in the status quo, punish certain crimes harder than others, even if it's the same crime. For example, in cases of hate crimes, we punish them harsher than if the crime was committed against not a minority, because one, it hurts the minority more, even though they're vulnerable individuals. And second, because it also affects the wider community. It's as in, it's not just a crime against one person, but rather it's a crime against a whole community of people. It is the same in high class areas, insofar as when you commit a crime in one of those areas, you are committing it against vulnerable individuals who probably don't have access to things such as better security services, who already live in very vulnerable conditions where they're victims to more crimes, and therefore this one affects them more, where they're probably poorer, and again, more vulnerable to bad things happening to them. And second, it's also crime against the whole community, because when I commit a crime in a really high class neighborhood somewhere in New York, sure, it's scary and it may be traumatizing for that person. But at the end of the day, people still know that they know that they live in a relatively safe area and people still can classify it as an isolated incident. It will probably get caught versus when I commit it in an area where it's already plagued by crime, then I the effect amplifies because people become more terrified because it's easier for other people to commit crimes because the police are already overstretched. Um, because when I rob one shop, then it suddenly becomes a lot more easier because when there's like 10 robberies, it becomes easier for them to become 20 insofar as police resources are already stretched, which means that I am not just committing a crime against one individual. I am also making it significantly easier for crime to flourish everywhere else. Overall, it just means that the effect is larger. Given that the justice system is not just about maximizing outcomes, it's also about giving sentences that are fair, which is why we have trials and why we seek to give punishments that fit crimes, that's something that we definitely should enshrine in society. Um, so overall, I think that there's like a principal argument that you can make in regards to this. Um, yeah, so like other motions where I think that it's interesting to sort of like talk a little bit about principles is um, I particularly like, and I'm going to just like throw this out there and leave them out for you to sort of like develop your own principle arguments. I think that it's also quite interesting to talk about um, um, mm, yeah, so I think that it's also uh, quite interesting to like in secular states, this house believes that self-identified supporters of the LGBT movement have a moral duty to abstain from marriage until gay marriage is legalized because I think that that one asks you to talk about moral responsibilities and how far they extend. And I think that if you want to say that they, um, that if you want to say that you do have a moral duty to do so, or that you don't have a moral duty to do so, it's interesting to chat about how far responsibility goes. So if I was on prop, I would probably say that you have a moral responsibility, like you don't have a moral responsibility to actively help people, but you definitely have a moral responsibility to not hurt them. So I would maybe not have a moral responsibility to like donate all of my money to women's charities but I def or, to, or to LGBT charities, but I definitely have a duty, a moral duty to not like kick LGBT people in the face and do something that actually harms them. So I do think that there's like an interesting discussion on moral responsibility and how it happens there, but I'm gonna leave that up to you to sort of develop. Um, yeah, and lastly, I just, and this, I promise this one is actually quickly. I just gonna talk about some nonsense principles and strategically and how strategically you can use them. So the them in debates, I think that although I did just speak for like 50 minutes or 40 minutes about how principles are important or how to make them really strong, you can't win solely on principles, or at least it's very difficult to win solely on principles. You still need practicalities. Everything, I think the ideal case should have both a principle, but also some practical arguments to back it up, right? I think that oftentimes principles are just quite useful to sort of like weigh up against practicals that others, the other side has. So if the other side has a very, very strong practical case, you do ideally want to be like one principle. Here's why even if all of the harms are true, we still wouldn't ascribe to that because this principle matters more than their utilitarian metric. But second, here is why their utilitarian metric is still not completely correct and why we think that it's not like massively harmful and why it's actually like fine or why it's actually like beneficial or whatever. I think that the thing that principles do in this situation is that if you make that argument a wash, as in if you go like if if you semi-convince the judges that like the practical harms that they talk about are not massive, 
then it's easier for you to take it over them, given that you also have some sort of principle justification. I think it's also useful when you're in closing. You can edge it out over your, over, over your opening. But if your opening has already convinced the judges that there are practical benefits to doing this policy, then you convincing them that it's also good to do them on principle probably won't take it over them. You ideally want to provide both uh, like more practical reasons why it would, but also a principle. I overall think that principles are really, really good complements that allow you to sort of like have to do less work on practical grounds. But I still think that it's really important that you still drive uh, principles or that, that you still drive principles behind practicals. That is, of course, unless the motion specifically asks you to talk about moral obligations or moral responsibility or on a principled level or moral duties, then in that case, fine, disregard practicalities, only focus on making like the strongest principle argument that you can make. So this is just kind of like little chat on strategy and BB. The last thing that I would like to mention is that I do think that principles are the best place where you want to deploy your rhetoric in debates is where all of the moral outrage that you have stored over the past, like however long you've been alive, should come into play. Because principles, as I already said, appeal to people's most intrinsic and most taking care of morals. So here is when you can really like tug at the heartstrings of judges. And like you don't have to be like an EPL British man to do this. You can do that anytime. I just think that a lot of a lot of times powerful principles are backed off by very powerful statements. So like on a motion like this, House would pay reparations to women. You can argue that you can't put a price on my oppression because women don't want money that might fix their problems. Women want those problems fixed because the word empowerment doesn't mean anything when you're still discriminated against, when you're still treated as a sexual object, when you're still talked down, when you're still paid less than men for equal work. At the end of the day, however, although it sounds powerful, you can't put a price on my oppression. It is, it's literally just a statement, right? It's not a fact, it's not an argument. But it sounds really powerful and it does help back up the, 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 the sort of like principled idea that we should oppose reparations because they don't really, like on a principled level, they are not equal to oppression and they never are. So I think that sort of like that does exemplify, however, that I do think that principles are a really nice place where you can sort of like deploy rhetoric and use rhetoric in really, really nice ways. So I would encourage you to do that because like, although judges say that persuasiveness doesn't always matter, I think in principle arguments, it can come into play. And again, it's not about how nicely or well you can say things. It's about how you're able to sort of like tug at heartstrings in regards to appealing to people's moral intuitions. So probably calling it like a rhetoric thing is not necessarily correct of me. It's more of a like, how can I best appeal to people's moral intuitions? Um, so yeah, again, highly encourage you to do that. And I think that that's it. So uh, hopefully you have learned some stuff about principles. Hopefully you've always also taken away that when you watch good debates, it's totally useless to do so unless, because copying arguments doesn't work. I think that the thing that does work is to sort of see how good speakers structure their arguments or how they make the arguments and then attempt to copy how they make those arguments and making on when, when you're making your own right rather than just mindlessly repeat what they do what they say and lastly sort of like do try to play with rhetoric when you give principled arguments and yeah so um hopefully that went out all right and I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Um, like I, as I already said, I put a link to the um, I put a link to like a short PowerPoint that I put together in regards to how to do the principles for people who aren't so good like me at following online workshops and would like to rather like read it. And I also put a link to like the three videos that I used in this workshop, so you can like go over them again if you want to. And yeah, uh, thank you very much. Hope you learned some stuff. Uh, if anyone has any questions about it, feel free to message me or whatever. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>